I know that I'm the last speaker here today. I want to leave with a very simple speech or TED talk or whatever you want to call it. Three stories, nothing too serious. I want to give you some energy before you leave. And I also, before I even start my talk, I want to say thank you to all the speakers for inspiring me personally today. Your messages and your ideas echoed what I believe in and really motivated me today. So thank you so much, you guys, really. And uh, I hope I can take this back home to Canada on my 20-hour flight. Anyways, thank you. Uh, let's move on. So three stories. Let's start with story number one. That's my name. <laughs> all right, story number one. There once was a young boy, 16 years old. He lived in Kuwait. This young boy hated school. He really disliked school. It wasn't for him. He felt he didn't belong there. So one day he decided to drop out. He, fi he didn't finish high school. He dropped out. Instead, he went and worked with his dad. He told his dad, I want to work with you. Teach me how to start a business. I want to start a business. His dad helped him and he eventually ended up starting a business in Kuwait. And along the way, he met a woman who he wanted to marry. He asked this woman, will you marry me? She said yes. They got married. They lived happily ever after. No, they didn't, they didn't do that. But, and then things went wrong. So they got married, everything was good, but things went wrong. His business started to fail in Kuwait. So he had one option, leave Kuwait, find another opportunity outside of Kuwait. He spoke to his wife. He told her, I have to leave. Uh, will you come with me? I, we have to leave and move abroad. She said yes. She joined him, and they left their home, their family, everyone. They left, and they went to the United Arab Emirates. They settled there. They had four kids. All of them were girls. They loved them, obviously, but the dad, he really wanted a boy. So a year, a year goes by. His wife is in labor. She wakes him up in the, at night. I'm going into labor. It's our fifth child. They don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. And she goes like, I have to go to the hospital now. We're going to go into labor. And he rushes, takes his keys, puts on his jacket. Let's go to the hospital. He's excited, nervous. He doesn't know if it's a boy or a girl. He goes to the hospital, takes her to the nurse. The nurse takes her to the doctor, delivery room. And he's excited and he's like waiting outside. Oh my God, it's a boy. Is it a boy or is it a girl? Is it a boy or is it a girl? And then he realizes, oh no, I forgot my camera at home. He's been recording his kids and documenting them every time they got the, during their birth. But this time he forgot his camera because he was so excited. So he's like, I have to go back home. He runs back home, gets in the car, goes back home, gets his camera. It was like this big. He grabs his camera, goes back to the hospital, starts running. Before he even goes into the hospital room, turns on his camera, starts recording. And he's running and he sees the nurse coming outside. The nurse approaches him with a big smile on her face. She tells him, it's a boy. And he's like, no way. And he hugs her. And he's like, oh, sorry, that was inappropriate. But, but anyways, he got so excited, he, start, he hugged the nurse. <laughs> As you might guess right now, the baby boy was me. <laughs> and my dad was really happy, obviously. So this happy, ups and downs, ups and downs, and then an up. Two years later, after my birth, my parents got divorced. And I don't remember anything from it, obviously. I was two years old. I don't even remember a time where my parents are together. So that's why I told you this story in the beginning, because I wanted to imagine with you how it was, how it was like when my mom and dad were together. But that's not what it was meant to be. They split up, they got divorced, and I lived a healthy, happy life. Even though the circumstance might have been tough, I had new siblings, my dad remarried. My young brother is here actually today. And this leads me to my second story, which is my story. So I talked about the past, which is my dad's story, and now my second story. So I was a very hyper kid. Um, I caused a lot of trouble in school. The teachers hated me. I was so energetic, always wanting to make trouble. After this picture was taken, I started screaming around the corridors just because I wanted to scream. So, actually, to, to prove to you how bad I was, there was one time I entered the classroom with a big smile on my face, walking like, you know, with a cheeky smile. The teacher looks at me, he's like, he said, just get out. I'm like, sir, I just came into the class. Just get out, I know what you're gonna do, just get out. And he kicks me out of the class. 
<laughs> just by my facial expression, he knew I was up to no good. I was really bad as a kid, obviously, you know, I was really hyper. <laughs> but the point is, even though I had all this energy, I was so into imagination. I had a huge imagination to the point where I loved watch mov watching movies, TV shows, cartoons, and everything like that. It's because I found myself in them. When I would watch a movie, I would imagine myself being that character, whoever he's playing, the hero. I would imagine myself being in that movie. Even when I turned the TV off and I went back to my room, I was still in that movie. I was in my head, I was still living that character's life. That imagination carried with me throughout my entire life. So my dad obviously noticed, he said he likes movies, you know, I make videos sometimes, home videos, I edit videos, and he's like, Asa, here, take your first camera. He gives me my first video camera. And then I start recording videos, just as a hobby, you know, obviously I just wanted to have fun, I wouldn't make videos, I would watch Harry Potter, by the way, I love Harry Potter. Anyways, oh. but <laughs> I, wanted to, I watched Harry Potter and I would see that, uh, the visual effects, I'm like, I want to recreate this, how can I do this? I was such a kid, I didn't know what I was doing. So I went online, tutorials, how to make effects, uh, Harry Potter. And then, the, like, there was Adobe After Effects uh, tutorials, which I followed and replicated. And I want to show you a montage of the videos that I made. By the way, not a lot of people have seen this. I used to post them back in Facebook days. <laughs> I made a montage of my videos uh, growing up and uh, just experimenting. By the way, just a warning, they're amazing videos, masterpieces. You're going to be surprised of how talented I am. So here, here you go. It should play any second, I guess. I feel like I want to punch myself in the face after watching that, but anyways. I think I even invented the Snapchat filter that with the green face, anyways. Uh, so, even though I had that passion for making videos and movies and all that, I had to switch my passions to somewhere else. A lot of people kept telling me, Asa, what are you doing? Videos are not going to get you anywhere. Keep it as a hobby. Focus on school. The only reason the only way you're going to su be successful in life is if you focus on school, get good grades, become a doctor, engineer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, as a stupid kid I was back then, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's good advice. I'm going to stop making videos. Let me focus on school for a bit. Obviously, it's a good thing to focus on school. I'm not discouraging that, but I put away a passion. And I'll get back to that later, but for now, let me tell you what happened. So I focused on my studies. I got really good at it. I thought, okay, I'm good in biology, I'm doing well. I even became head boy of the school, which I gave the graduation speech. So it was, I was, you know, doing really well, you know, being social in school, doing extracurricular activities, you know, getting good grades. But then I realized something was wrong. I wanted to leave. I wanted to go out there, try something new. I wanted to travel abroad. I wanted to study abroad. I felt like if I studied back home, whatever it is, UAE, Kuwait, it's going to trap me into something I don't want to be into. So I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get really good grades in my last year of high school, apply for a scholarship, and end, ended up getting the scholarship to study medicine in Canada. And going to Canada, this is my first day ever in Canada, six years ago. First time seeing snow, not wearing enough clothes, it was minus like 12 outside. Uh, very innocent face, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. My mom came with me that time for two weeks. She prepared everything. I never did my dishes before. I never did my laundry. I've never lived alone ever. She prepared everything. She made even like, she put food in the fridge for like two weeks, three weeks. And uh, she's like, Asa, you're going to live by yourself now. Are you ready? Yeah, of course. I'm going to live by myself. I love this. <laughs> and then she leaves. She actually left to the airport while I was in class. So I came back home. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have my apartment to myself now. It's cool. And then I, t I opened the door. And I, I go inside and I see the empty apartment. My mom was not there. And I've never been more scared in my entire life. I was alone in a country thousands of miles away from home. My mom was not there. I've always been dependent on my mom. I don't know what I'm doing here. Am I ready to study medicine? Do I like medicine? Am I, do I, like what am I doing, you know? 
I pushed through. I went three years trying to get good grades. I was struggling a lot. But one day at uni, I was walking around, and I saw t these two guys handing out flyers. You know, I was really stressed out. I had midterms and was doing re really bad. My GPA was not meeting the med medicine GPA. And I went up to these two guys who were handing out flyers, and I take one of the flyers, and it said, volunteer abroad, Costa Rica. Costa Rica, wow, that, that sounds interesting. Let me, let me see what that is. Okay, I wanted to travel, maybe, okay, the beach, uh, weather, summer, and everything like that. I applied, and I got in and ended up traveling to this trip, which I thought was going to be fun, it's going to be you know, a nice escape from school, but everything changed when I went on this volunteer trip. I lived with a family, a Spanish-speaking family, mem five members, this is my other uh, roommate, and it was like a small house, poor conditions, and we would go fishing with this family, you know, and we were helping the school out and everything. It was like, it was hard, it was hot, I was scared, I was out of my comfort zone, but at the end of those two weeks, my whole perspective on life completely changed forever. I thought to myself, I never ever did volunteering, I never took it seriously. I mean, always when I look at people who volunteer, they're doing good things, but I never took that seriously. But when I tried it for myself in a way that is different and worked for me, such as traveling and volunteering, I'm like, this is it. This is something special here. So I go back, uni, and the semester goes back, and then I apply for another volunteer trip, and another one. Every time I had a holiday, I would save up money and go and volunteer abroad. I ended up going on six different trips, and it became an addiction. I loved doing that because it was an escape. I was having these valleys at school. I hated what I was doing at school. My, the courses were not interesting to me. But then, when I would travel, I hit these peaks. It was like these amazing feeling I was getting when I was doing I was Not only was I helping people, or whatever you want to call it, but I was gaining so much. It was weird how I was gaining more than I thought I was giving. It was like my life was, meant, had something, had a meaning when I'm there. Teaching kids, marine conservation, wildlife conservation, uh, this is one of my orphan elephants. So I learned a lot during these trips, not just the fact that you can help and you know, learn about cultures, but I learned a lot about the environment, how to conserve it, what's the issues we have today, all these things they were teaching us on these trips. And I'm like, how am I missing out on this? How, how does not everyone know about this? So what I did was, I took my camera with me on these trips, and I started documenting. This is where my passion for filmmaking came back. I had left making videos for a long time. Now I'm like, let me just take my camera with me on these trips and start documenting everything. You know, I would go on these amazing you know, countries and everything, and I would record everything and make these videos and post them online. And people were like, oh, that's cool, Ace, what are you doing? And then I'm getting these, this kind of like positive feedback on my videos. I'm like, oh, I know how to edit videos. I'm, I kind of like making videos, this is fun. And, it, and this passion started to grow back again. It's like I left a part of me for a long time dormant somewhere else, and then I, and I got it back somehow. And it was like that burning desire just came back to me in, in an intense way. But then again, I had school, I had medicine to pursue. My parents were counting on me. I had a scholarship, I had to meet my GPA. All these things I had to struggle with, I had to balance. My time management was horrible. I was living by myself, I had to do my laundry, I had to do my dishes, you know, all these things, they're hard to balance. But whenever I was on these trips and whenever I was making videos, I was happy. To the point where volunteering even affected the content I was putting out there. Yusuf and Omar, they were talking about conscious content. This is the type of content I started to relate to as well when I was watching their videos and people who posted such videos. I started to relate to that kind of content because this is what I'm trying to do with volunteering. So that's how I shifted my, even the videos that I was making to something more meaningful. And I started making, I worked on my first short film, and how I worked on it, or my first short film, was I saw an ad online that said, apply for a Young Creatives Award by the International Emmys, it's a new category, competition, one minute video. I'm like, wow, this is great. I've been documenting for the past uh, year or two years. I have this experience of making short videos, so let me try it out. I wrote a, I wrote a script, and I, wrote a, I directed it, and then it ended up being made. And the story, as it was called Domestic Psycho, was this film. Um, the whole point of the story for me was this person, the character, the girl, she was trapped. She was trapped in this environment, this negative environment. And then she makes a change. She decides to do something to escape or get out of this environment. It kind of mirrored my life in some way, in a weird way. That's why I felt connected to it. 
I didn't want to talk about it too much. I just posted it. I'm like, even if I don't win, I don't get the opportunity to go New York, red carpet, whatever it is. That doesn't matter to me. It's like I created something that was meaningful to me. Ended up, and I ended up winning, which was a surprise to me. The jury did, thank you. The jury picked my film, and, I was, and they flew me to New York, and I got on the red carpet. This was me on the first, first time on the red carpet. You can't imagine the whole time I was there, I'm like, why am I here? What am I doing here? Why, why are people taking pictures of me? This doesn't make sense. But then I connected with something in my childhood. Back when I was a kid, when my parents, everyone would go to sleep, my sisters, my brother, everyone, I would sneak outside, open the TV, and watch the Oscars, watch the Emmys, watch whatever, because I was so like, into these kind of things, because I, I felt like I, I was part of that community somehow, I don't know. I'm like, one day I'm going to walk the art carpet. As a kid, I always thought about that, but then, obviously, you don't take these things seriously, but th these things, they ingrain inside your mind and your imagination. It creates this thing that you, f you feel like you put a limit, and then you can, you're able to crush that limit easily. And that's how this, this proves to me that, that there is no such thing as a limit. Your imagination is your limit. That's what it is. And this leads me to my last and final story. And since this is the last talk, I want to switch it up and talk about you guys. So I've talked about my dad, my, my past. I've talked about me, my present. Now let's switch it up to you. You've, you've guys listened to all these talks today. Let's test out a theory. Let's imagine this guy over here, my friend, he comes up to you and he goes like, let's meet and have coffee next week. And you know this person here, he gives horrible advice. He's such a person who, who gives you like the worst kind of advice ever. <laughs> and you don't trust him, but you're like, you know, I'm going to go and listen to what he has to say. So you sit with him, have a coffee, and he goes like, you know what? <laughs> Traveling is, is horrible. It's expensive. Don't do it. You know, there's no point in it. You know, just stay home, watch Netflix. And then you realize, okay, what is he trying to say? Let me try to create some positive of what he's trying to say. And you look at him, and you're like, you know what, you're right. Traveling is not the solution. You're able to do what you want to do at home. You can change your perspective at home. Your life can change while you're at home. It doesn't matter. It's, it's not where you travel to or whatever. It's what you do when you travel that makes the difference. It's the actions you make, the, the things you change in your mind. So you go like, you know what, you're right, I don't have to travel, I don't, I don't like traveling, I'm gonna change my life, you know, regardless. He goes like, you know what, he, that's a good point, let me try something else. And he tells you, volunteering, it's horrible. It's for people who show off, it's for people who wanna make a name for themselves. It's, it's selfish, you know what, it's selfish. It's like, what, so volunteering is selfish? And you think about it, you're like, you know what? Because you're trying to change that, that negative feeling or that negative opinion into something positive, and you go like, you know what, you're right. Volunteering is a selfish act because you're gaining way more, way more than you're giving. Is that true? You're gaining a perspective and experience, knowledge, wisdom, all these things you're gaining. It's selfish. When you're volunteering, you're being selfish. And obviously, you're being selfish as well, but you're being more selfish, I would, in my opinion. And then he looks at you, he's like, this guy, you know, whatever. <laughs> and he tells you, you know what, I'm gonna give you the best advice to change your entire life, and you cut him off. You're like, hey, stop, stop, I don't wanna talk to you anymore. And you leave. You shouldn't take such advice in the first place because all of us have different lives. We all live different lives. We have peaks and valleys. All of us live a life where there's a peak and a valley. Some people have more peaks, some people have more valleys, and our circumstances, sometimes you can't control these circumstances. You might have a horrible life, but there's one thing you can control, how you react to everything, how your attitude is to everything. So whatever situation you're in, you're able to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to react this way to it, positively or negatively, obviously. You can choose. You have that choice. You don't have the choice of choosing your surroundings sometimes, but you have the choice on how to deal with your surroundings. You can't have a life with just a peak or just a valley. Just think of it as like an electro cardio electrograph. You know, when you're plugging in the heart, uh, heart rate and you're seeing the beep, 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 the waves of the heart rate. When that's happening, that, per that means the person's alive, right? When it's a straight line, what does that mean? Dead. dead. So when it's a straight line, li there's no life. It's dead. You need that sort of contrast. There's no joy without sadness. There's no struggle without ease. All these things, it's a part of life. So once you realize that and you tell yourself, you know what, in these situations, 
in these negative situations, I can turn it into a peak in my mind. And that's what I want you to take away from this today, is that you're able to change your mindset, your perspective, in whatever way possible. Always look forward. When you look backwards and all your mistakes and all your failures, your failures can help you grow. Learn from them, grow from them, and look forward. Always move forward. Because when you're moving forward, you're able to make a difference. Because you're improving, you're getting better, you're learning. And when you're making a difference, that means you're leaving your fingerprints in this world. And I hope every one of us today leaves, looks forward, and makes a difference, and leaves their fingerprint. Thank you so much. Yeah.